people I don't know, have a tiny little window into all of your knowledge and some of what you wrote down in the textbook. Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. So I'm going to just introduce Amber shortly. Well, let me first introduce myself. I am Tamsin Murphy. I am um, the one of the editors of the textbook Ketogenics. Um, and I am also a content editor at Nutrition Network and a lecturer at Nutrition Network. Um, and Amber Hearn is one of our esteemed authors of the textbook. She has an MSc and is a carnivore diet thought leader who popularized the term lipovore to describe the evolutionary human adaptation to a high fat, low carb meat centered diet. Amber Hearn is a data researcher or a data researcher, a founder of, of Carnivory Con, an annual conference dedicated to the carnivore lifestyle and author of Eat Meat, Not Too Little, Mostly Fat. And O'Hearn has experimented with low carbon ketogenic diets for decades, eventually finding her way to carnivore. Um, and I, I can definitely recommend that any of you go and look on YouTube and watch anything that she's, she's said and spoken about to get a better idea about her and her own health, um, her own health journey. Um, but also you can go onto PubMed or Google Scholar and find various publications by Amber, not only in the health space, but in the computer programming space and various other things. An absolutely brilliant, brilliant mind. So welcome, Amber. Really good to have you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. <laughs> And then in this chapter two, so, so ketogenics, the, uh, the science of therapeutic carbohydrate restriction is the first textbook of its kind that really deals with um, therapeutic carbohydrate restriction, low carb, high fat, and all its versions, if you will. So that kind of delves into carnivore would be included under that umbrella because it's a low carb, high fat diet. Uh, paleo even versions of that would be, uh, keto would be, Banting, Atkins, they're all versions of low carb, high fat. And it turns out that there's a whole lot of evidence-based applications for, for therapeutic carbohydrate restriction by its many names. Um, and there's a whole lot more anecdotal, um, anecdotal kind of indications for it as well. But this, study really, uh, this textbook really deals with the evidence-based applications of therapeutic carbohydrate restriction, going all the way from giving you a, an, an, a basic understanding all the way from human evolution when we became homo sapiens and we uh, spoke yesterday if you would like to go back if you didn't catch yesterday's live with professor tim noakes and catherine crofts and uh, mickey bendor couldn't make it but he was also uh, one of the three key authors of uh, chapter one um, of this textbook and we spoke all the way about human evolution how we evolved and then we went into um we went into where things started to go awry with our brains starting to shrink upon losing out on the big fatty animals and moving over to more medium sized animals. And then eventually we killed many of them off and we started agriculture. We spoke about all of that. And then we spoke about we didn't even get a chance to talk about the dietary guidelines, which was a key like the a third of the chapter was dietary guidelines. We didn't even get a chance to talk about that because it was it's such a. Oh, it's just so much to talk about. And then Catherine Croft spoke to us about insulin resistance and about why it's insulin has far more effects than just regulating glucose. And she spoke about how basically all the cells in the body are affected by insulin and that we shouldn't have such a myopic view of insulin and it's glucose only affecting effects. And um, so that was a really, really great discussion. And then I said that today we would be talking about chapter two which is called Nutritional Aspects. And in this chapter, um, the textbook deals with the basics of therapeutic carbohydrate restriction, going all the way into a little bit more detail into ketosis, the role of ketones in the body, and looking a little bit more into the nuances of a therapeutic carbohydrate restricted diet, because really you could be eating a therapeutic carbohydrate restricted diet and living on seed oils. It would be, you know, maybe not very therapeutic. Well, um, but it certainly would be carbohydrate restricted, right? But it's not going to be healthy. So we are deal in this chapter also about the, the different aspects of the diet, what makes a well-formulated diet. Um, and then it ends off, I think, in the pinnacle of this chapter where Amber tells us about ketones and delves a little bit more, touches on the biochemistry. Um, unfortunately, I think we really need a triple, quadruple, maybe even 10 times the room in this textbook to cover everything that really needs to be covered, but hopefully we'll have edition two, edition three, and so on of this textbook. So um, other than Amber, we have um, 
we have Eric Westman, who was a key contributor to this to this um, chapter, this chapter two, William um, Yancey, and then we also have a brief contribution by Neville Willington as well. So those are our authors of this. And so let me just get started before we talk to Amber about her section. Let's talk a little bit about, I'm going to take you through the beginning part, the first half of the chapter, the first two thirds of the chapter, which deals mainly with therapeutic carbohydrate restriction and formulating that diet. And um, I'm mainly going to talk because I'm going to give you a whirlwind overview before we really delve into the nitty gritty with Amber, which is super exciting. But I might ask her for a few um a few inputs on on the way. Okay, so bear with me while I do this whirlwind tour as best I can. Um, basically, we start chapter two by defining therapeutic carbohydrate restriction. As I've said, I've given you a whole lot of other names for it. I think most of you know what it is. Therapeutic, though, implies that it is its application that this textbook is focusing on is combating or dealing with conditions. Um, whether that is normally therapeutic kind of leaves out prophylaxis or preventative measures, but in this textbook, we don't leave that out. But there is a heavy focus, a third of the textbook is in treating conditions with therapeutic carbohydrate restriction. So there is a heavy emphasis on that. What is therapeutic carbohydrate restriction, LCHF? It basically is, um, if you want to go, big, go under the big broad umbrella, most people would agree it's under 130 grams of carbohydrates per day, as defined by Feynman in his um, 2015 paper, or under 26% of energy coming from carbohydrates. So that's a low carbohydrate diet. But you can go even lower into a very low carbohydrate diet, which is also known as a ketogenic diet, where you're eating below 50 grams of carbohydrate per day, or less than you know 5 to 10% of your energy coming from carbohydrates. Then protein, I mean, there's a lot of arguments and I'm giving a very, brief, a very broad overview, but everyone kind of agrees that we need around 15% to 35% of our energy coming from protein. You have the low protein people on the 0 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight side, um, but most people who use, oh, I see Eric Westman is joining us. That's wonderful. He's in the waiting room. Okay, great. Then I don't have to give too much of this, but I'm just quickly going to say you have the low protein people on the 0 0.8 uh, grams per kilogram body weight. And then that generally most people agree that you want at least one gram per kilogram body weight. Some people say that can go up to three grams per kilogram body weight. Other people say no, two to 2.5 grams per kilogram body weight. Either way, we're dealing in a kind of small range with protein. Um, and the arguments are within that. And fat is generally, people agree on this way of eating, it's going to be over 60%. And again, some people will say, well, it should be over 80%. But that's the general gist of what the diet looks like from a macro perspective. Yes, Amber, did you want to contribute? No. Okay. Uh, no, although I did want to say earlier when you were talking about uh, the textbook in general, I just think it's so fantastic that finally, you know, a century after a lot of the science on this whole ketogenic metabolism began that we finally have this kind of textbook that is a general guide for so many different conditions, not just epilepsy. And it's been, you know, it's been a long time coming. I think this is a really amazing contribution to the world and she'll really move things forward. Oh, thank you, Amber. I totally agree. I really do. I think that this is well, well overdue. And it's the really important pioneering work that the likes of you and Dr. Westman welcome. I'm so glad you could join us. This is wonderful. What an honor um, to have wonderful, amazing pioneers in the space like the two of you and our other authors. Um, you've done so much work that really it's actually about time that we see a bit of recognition um, for all the literature that is in support of it. This isn't even, you know, it's not it's not old. Well, some of it's really old if we look at his, the history of humankind. But I mean, we have literature supporting this. This is not a lack of evidence based area, really. So. Um, so thank you, Amber. Um, Dr. Westman, I have introduced you um, briefly already uh, before you arrive, but it's wonderful to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you were such a crucial, you are such a crucial author in this in this chapter, chapter two, nutritional aspects, because you basically, you with um, Dr. Yancey, deal with everything that is therapeutic carbide restriction. You guys uh, define it um, in this textbook and, and give clinicians, whether it's dietitians like me or 
you know, the GP, the general practitioner, medical doctor in his rooms, or whether it's, you know, just interested people, you you tell them what it is, and you give cautions, contraindications, um, and you give real life examples of what people would be eating on this way of on this way of eating. So, um, so this is a really really important concrete chapter and contribution from you, Dr. Westman. So, I look forward to hearing more of what you have to say in the chapter in this whirlwind tour of it. Yes, well, thank you so much. Uh, the work that we've done borrowed from work done by doctors and largely clinicians for hundreds of years, uh, or if, you know, in, in the Western world, if you will, back to, through Banting and uh, Frederick Allen and uh, William Osler for the diabetes treatment. And it's important to realize that what we're talking about is different than the ketogenic diet for epilepsy. It has different roots. It has a di whole different uh, background where we, we're not as strict and we're not as, as compulsive about every meal. And, and you know, if you have a carb here and there, you're not gonna have a seizure, you know, a catastrophic event, like it happens with uh, children who are, who are on the ketogenic diet. So the therapeutic carbohydrate restriction has its own history of use and safe use um, and the publications actually, you know, it, it was kind of funny that when we hit the literature in the late 1990s, there were very few studies done. And the one study that was done on the low fat diet, excuse me, low carb diet uh, had 20 people in it or so. And it was done by an NIH, uh, so a, a government funded group. And because uh, everyone lost weight, but because the LDL went up, just a little bit, they said, you can't do this diet, it's unhealthy. And, and the, the echo of that still, it, it, we hear today, um, this was a paper in 1980, and it kind of put the, the nail in the coffin of the Atkins diet, as it was called then. So Jeff Volick and I approached Dr. Atkins in the late 1990s to fund research. And that's just a whole nother story of why doesn't the government fund this kind of research, or why don't other organizations? And uh, so we we both just approached the doctor who had written the books, and um, he started the research going. Now research has been done all over the world by some government organizations, and I'm happy to learn just recently this year that some NIH, National Institute of Health uh, groups, are being funded to study the low carb diets and um but this is what wow. 2023 <laughs> I, I was just um uh, showing one of my patients and i'm sorry I, i'm in the middle of a, a busy clinic today um the book from 1923 the, the actual book it, it's the william osler uh textbook of medicine and in there the treatment for diabetes was the exact treatment that i'm handing out on a list of paper the the uh diet that we've studied and published papers on and and we outline that in the chapter in the textbook so it's really exciting to to put this information in that includes the clinical use but also the scientific validation and publication now that so many papers have been done all over the world um, and the various types of low carb diets even to the level of a, a carnivore type of diet, which means you know, no vegetable matter at all. And in some cases, I guess, because wolves don't drink coffee, you can't even have coffee. Is that right, Amber? <laughs> uh, but, uh, well, it depends. Yeah, so, <laughs> there are some allowances but, made. <laughs> there are a lot of ways to do it, and, and you can do it strictly or more relaxed way. And, and um, so time passed. We, we published studies. We have a clinic here at Duke, and I, I use this uh, four weekdays out of the week in an office setting with Dr. Yancey as well. And I'm treating all sorts of medical issues uh, that um, we outline a little bit. And so that I, I think we've come up with a safe use, sort of the guardrails of, you know, when do you have to worry about the medical aspects? When, when could you just do this without even anyone other than a coach, which I, you know, I, I'm teaching more people now online through internet uh, uh, sorts of educational programs than I am in the clinic. It, it's very labor intensive to be one-on-one -on -one with somebody. And so if you don't have medical issues, you're not on medication, 
there's a, a safe use of this. It, it's just food. It's just changing the food. Although, because this is a chapter in the textbook, we do we kind of medicalize it a bit, uh, but um, meaning we want people to be followed if they're mm. medically ill, for sure. Uh, but, but if they're uh, not medically ill, you're saying it's relatively safe to use. And in this chapter, you do provide some examples of meal plans, how the diet actually looks in a very concrete way. So when would you say, Dr. Westman, that you feel that people or it should be medicalized or it should be closely followed? Who are the high risk patients when going yeah. on therapeutic carbohydrate restriction or low carb diets? Well, so definitely if you're taking medicine for diabetes or high blood pressure, these uh, two things get better. Sometimes on the first day you start program, uh, I often will reduce the insulin in one half by 50% on the first day, insulin being used to treat diabetes. Um, so we give uh, examples of that and um, other medical issues um, can be handled uh, uh, but diabetes and high blood pressure, especially, you, you need monitoring. And then I think for the the uh, support aspect, if this is going to be a long journey, you know, um, the average person who comes to my office has about 150 pounds, so 70 kilos to lose for weight, and that's the average. <laughs> so, so if you're, if you, you know, this is going to have to be a lifestyle change for a while, and while it's not a medical thing, I, I can help instruct, keep people going. Uh, uh, you definitely want to be with a coach who's trained to help someone, uh, ideally someone who understands, uh, again, when would you need to consult a doctor. Um, but um, this new organization called the Society of Medical, Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners um, doesn't require a physician degree and I think that's going to be one of our um, uh, long-term um, fixes, mm -hmm. like Nutrition Network training mm -hmm. people who are not, they don't, you don't need a medical, you don't need to know how to do surgery to help someone change their life with food. Uh, so, um, but yes. the, the medical chapter in here with the yeah, definitions going back and then how to implement it and then where you want to, check laboratory tests or be sure to check in. Hmm. Um, it's a, it's a, a first, So you do, really. you, yeah, it really is. And you do actually explain in a, a very clear, stepwise, logical manner that clinicians, health coaches, dietitians, nurses, um, patients can follow and kind of get an idea of how to implement this diet and when a medical doctor is required, which definitely would be when it comes to deprescribing medication at the very least. Um, there was also a table included in your chapter that looks at contraindications, which are very unusual. I mean, that's more like um, genetic difficulties with, carn with you know, problems with carn carnitine or problems with, with glucose um, metabolism or por porphyria perhaps but um, you know it's generally like you say it, most people can do it and the medical doctor you discuss the you discuss the deep prescription in your in your section and then you do go into the labs and the assessment and monitoring can you tell us more about um, about that what kind of assessment and monitoring do you recommend in this chapter uh, that people have done who are following this diet or that doctors do or dietitians or medical practitioners or coaches even do. Yeah, well, as time goes on, I get less and less worried about lab tests. <laughs> and in fact, I, I just counseled someone this morning to not check anything until they had lost the weight because sometimes other doctors will, will interpret the labs in a, in, in a bad way, over-interpret or, or have a, a negative view of things like the cholesterol level going up while someone's losing weight, you don't want to worry about the cholesterol level, or they might be worried about the ketone level being a little high. Well, we're using nutritional ketosis. We're, we want <laughs> ketones in the blood. So we do have, uh, you know, I, I, so I worry about labs at the beginning, particularly if someone's been on medications that can perturb okay. the system. So if someone's, and, and these days, uh, most people come to me on four or five medicines already. They're going to be on a diuretic pill of some sort that depletes the uh, magnesium and potassium perhaps. Mm -hmm. So um, the baseline labs, if you're 
in a medical situation would include sort of a, an assessment of baseline health. However, that's generally defined, including electrolytes if they're on diuretics. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, the, the well, other... I mean in that context, Dr. Westman, it seems ridiculous that, you know, people are so concerned about the safety of a diet, which is a very evolutionarily consistent species specific diet, as we spoke about yesterday during the Facebook Live with Noakes and, um, you know, but yet, yet they're so quick to, to prescribe medications, which always have side effects. Um, it seems so strange to me, um, and I think many, many people who are in this space, but could you maybe tell us a little bit about the, the side effects that might come with this diet, which you discuss in the chapter, because I know it's not, not very serious side effects like you often see on medications such as statins, which when we talk to Dr. Ali about the cardiovascular chapter, you'll hear a lot about this whole cholesterol uh, business and about statins and about all the deleterious health effects associated with that. And, but, um, you know, there are some side effects for someone who's going from a standard American diet onto a low carb or ketogenic diet. And I just wanted to fill you in Dr. Westman before you arrived, I did just briefly give a very wide overview of what a low carbohydrate diet is, what a ketogenic diet is. So our listeners do know, um, but there are some side effects and you go into them, the acute ones, the more chronic potential ones, the mild ones. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Uh, should people be worried? No, and a lot of my time is spent to relieve worry. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, I have to say that there are positive side effects. You, you can notice appetite reduction in the first day or two, or even elimination of appetite, you, which that's how it works for weight loss. You get more energy very quickly. Most people, when they talk about side effects, they're focusing on the adverse side effects. The, um, you might get cravings for food that you've had for a long time, that passes pretty quickly. The keto adaptation side effects, meaning you're going from carb eating and carb burning to not eating carbs and fat burning might mm. include headache or fatigue for a few days. Very okay. unusual that you'll hear about it. You might have, feel like you have the flu with muscle aches, that sort of thing for a few days, or yeah, occasionally I'll have someone who says it happened for more than a few days, but it's important to know that in my, it's an informal survey, but I, I will be in front of say 500 people at a time. And I'll ask questions like, how many of you had keto flu, meaning headaches and, and uh, that mm -hmm. sort of side effects. And best I can tell it's about a third of people okay. who have it. So if you're and rolling then when the they dice. Collect, when they correct their electrolytes though, I mean, it seems like it's a very, it's a very, it's got a great solution. I mean, it's very right. easily solved, right? Yeah, so, in fact, so you can you can wait until someone has a side effect and then say, mm. add some salt or or, or a bouillon cube is a way to get some broth or or a electrolyte formulation. Or you can uh, ask people to just preemptively take those electrolytes. We think that's what's going on to mm. cause these symptoms. But in a clinical population like mine, uh, a lot of people are on high blood pressure medicine. They really shouldn't have extra salt. Uh, if they are being treated for heart failure or kidney failure, then I have to be careful not to add too much salt. Um, but so we go through all of you know the worst case scenarios. And but for uh, someone who doesn't need the medical monitoring, yeah, it's just add some electrolytes. It's a pretty easy okay. fix. And that solves a lot of things. That'll solve, like you mentioned in the book, it'll solve the keto flu, but it'll also so, so often solve your constipation. It'll solve, you know, if you've just got the headache or um, if you've got Muscle orthostatic cramps. hypotension from standing up. So basically it's it's all because of this natriuresis of fasting, which is when your insulin drops and then your kidneys are no longer going to be holding on to as much fluid. You're now getting rid of more fluid and you're getting rid of more sodium, which drops your circulating blood volume, drops your blood pressure, ends up, you just are less, less hydrated. You're going to end up constipated. You're going to end up having a little bit of dizziness on standing. But as you explain, 
you know, just take a little bit of salt and you're going to retain more of that fluid, your circulating blood volume is going to go up and you can be fine. So people get very scared, you know, of some of these side effects, um, like this keto, you know, you're going to have aches, and you're going to have all of, but actually it seems like it's really easily solved and it's not actually a huge deal. Um, so I think I think you explain it so nicely and so clearly in the book, um, and I think clinicians are really going to find it useful. But now you have mentioned the cholesterol, and I, I don't want to go in too in depth into this. Um, and I also do want to go into the the big topic that Amber goes into, which is the ketones and the ketosis. But just very briefly, you know, you you have mentioned a few times. So I do want to touch on it. People are scared. People are scared of going high fat um, because you know, high saturated fat, they're going to end up with high cholesterol and then their cardiologists are going to freak out. So can you tell us how do you deal with this? Why is just in brief, I know it's complicated, but why, why is this not really a concern for you? Um, so yeah. The, the old way, the old way to look at a blood cholesterol or lipid panel, uh, same thing, um, is to look at the total and the LDL cholesterol only. Mm -hmm. Those are the focus and even the language becomes bad cholesterol. The LDL is the bad cholesterol. Yes. Well, the, the new way, and it's using the new technology of keto, if you will, <laughs> is to look at the triglyceride and the HDL in the blood. Mm -hmm. And so I'll pull up that on the computer screen and, and cover the, the, the new and the old and show, well, you know, in the old way, it looks like it might be worse. I mean, a doctor might want to give you a pill. But if you look at it, the new way, actually the triglyceride went way down and the HDL has never been this high before and that keeps going up. And so just relax, give it more time. So it's really a, a, um, a um, transforming view to consider in the big picture it's called the metabolic syndrome, looking at that blood test, that's the component of metabolic syndrome. And so focus on the triglyceride HDL, uh, mm -hmm. knowing that a lot of other doctors trained the old way will want to focus on the, the mm. total and LDL. Um, and But, you know, if someone's just focusing on LDL, they're not understanding the subgroups of LDL. There's large and they're, they're small and preventive cardiologists, even uh, in, in the U.S., even preventive cardiologists will admit that the type of LDL matters. And if it's a large, buffy LDL, it's not going to be as problematic. But the problem is that's not tissue. generally tested for, is it? It's clinically. I no. mean, it's tested well, for in know. research papers, but yeah. Well, and so you never really know. You just look at this big, scary LDL number, which isn't necessarily so scary. Um, and well, I really do recommend could, that. Sorry. If I yes. could chime in there just a little bit, something that I really appreciate about Dr. Westman's um, work and, and something that he's mentioned a lot is that when you're looking at these two different kinds of metabolic states, the one that you would be on if you're on a ketogenic diet, and one that you would be on if you're eating a more high carbohydrate diet, a lot of things are, are going to change. A lot of the ranges that we've kind of developed um, over time to represent what we think is normal are, are going to be completely different just because we're in a me metabolic state that's different. And so I think it's really important that we start to um, recognize that there's there's a normal for high carbohydrate and there's a normal for ketogenic. And so for example, if you're on a high carbohydrate diet and you have high ketones, that could indicate a real problem. But if you are on a ketogenic diet, you would expect to have high ketones and it's not a real problem. And so likewise, we should also expect for many different components of blood work that different ranges are going to be what you would expect and not be a cause for alarm. And so I think that it's really important that we start to establish these new ranges so that the alarm bells that you would think of if you expected or um, assumed that a person was eating high carb are not going to be alarm bells if they're on a low, low carb diet. You know, I, you. I'm afraid I need to, I need to run back to my clinic. I'm so sorry, I couldn't cancel. Well, Dr. Westman, yeah. I think we've really covered the key aspects to your section. So we really appreciate your time. I know you're in a very busy clinical practice and this was really important and that people know what you've written about and know what to expect from your section. Thank you so much for making the time well, to be here. It's my pleasure to, to contribute. When we, we've been criticized through the years from the beginning to be too practical and, and to be too, too easy 
and you know, it can't be that easy. It can't be that simple, <laughs> but it is. So I'm so happy to be able to contribute to this textbook. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And it is practical. It's really practical. If you read Dr. Westman, Dr. Yancey's sections, it's practical. It's so wonderful to be able to just read it, know what to do in your practice, know what the cautions are. Um, yeah, really amazing section. Thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. Bye-bye. Goodbye. So Amber, um, Dr. Westman mentioned something. He, he touched on ketosis. And I wanted to go into that in a little bit more detail with you because your section is all about ketosis and also about contextual stuff. Um, and I know you've just touched on that when it comes to the contextual nature of reading labs. Um, but in your section, you also go into the contextual nature of dietary requirements, nutritional sufficiency, um, all of those kind of things. So we haven't got that long because it's a huge section. I could talk to you all day about it, but we don't have all day. So I think let's, let's park the contextual stuff for a little bit later and let's go into the ketosis stuff um and you know you mentioned dr westman also mentioned that you know people are scared of ketones in the blood and ketosis but i know in your section you start off you know talking a little bit about ketosis versus fasting versus starvation versus ketoacidosis now to a lot of us these are synonymous um, could you maybe start for us by just prizing them apart? What is ketosis? How does it differ from fasting and starvation and ketoacidosis? Um, and if we could just start there, maybe we could start getting a little bit of an inroads into what's going on metabolically when you say someone is on a ketogenic diet and going into ketosis, and we can take it from there. Yes, well, it's a bit of a coincidence from history, really, that w the metabolic state that that we first discovered ketone bodies and this whole uh, ketogenic metabolism in happened to come from when people stopped eating. Um, and that's just because the, our, you know, our, our whole agricultural society is now on a, a high carb diet by default, a grain based diet by default, which as apparently you were discussing a lot yesterday, wasn't really the case for most of our evolutionary past. Um, for humans and, and even for um, homo uh, kinds of species leading up to the human species, but for, for millions of years. Um, so it seems like it, it's a very natural assumption if you um, only discovered this kind of new state when you stopped eating that you would think that it's it's a, a result of fasting. But that's that's not really true. Obviously, we know that you don't need to be totally fasted to get into a, a ketogenic state. And so, it, but historically, a lot of what we know about fasting comes from studies in humans that are completely fasted or other animals that are completely fasted. And so there's a bit of a conflation because obviously, I mean, not eating is not sustainable. <laughs> and not getting nutrition can, comes with all kinds of problems that you might think are just a consequence of being in a ketogenic state. And since there is the ability to be ketogenic without that nutritional deprivation, it turns out that a lot of those concerns don't really apply. Um, so in order to be ketogenic, there are basically two things that have to occur. One is that your, your glucose has to be low, and one is that your fat has to be high. And for humans, um, for, for other animals, often um, protein has to be drastically reduced. Humans seem to have a, a much higher level of tolerance for protein intake than, and, than any other animals that we've studied. And to be able to take some protein, to take adequate protein and even a little bit more and still remain in ketosis. And that seems to be largely um, probably functionally because of the brain um, needing to, to function and is often, um, we think of the brain as needing glucose and it does need some glucose. But since ketone bodies can, um, can be fuel for the brain, um, as long as you have enough uh, ketones, you can drastically reduce the amount of glucose that the brain needs 
and continue to supply enough. But humans have such large brains that we are much more willing to be ketogenic even when there is uh, enough protein to provide glucose through gluconeogenesis. Well, that's so interesting because, you know, you hear, okay, let me just quickly backtrack a little bit because I think there are a few little holes that, that I want to fill in for, although most people know this, um, but, okay, so ke ketones are, are basically short chain fatty acids that are made from your fat. They can also be made from protein, but you don't really want to make them from protein. But so these things are made in your body. Generally, when you, like Amber said, when you're, there's, there's no food around. So let's say you're in a concentration camp or you're really starved or there's a famine or whatever. Um, you're going to start breaking down fat and some of that fat's going to fuel your, your cells, but also it's going to be turned into these little short chain fatty acids, which are really helpful because they can kind of take the place of glucose for certain tissues that can't use fat. So like the brain, for example. So they're really useful like that. But people are scared of ketones um, often because they have been implicated, okay, obviously in people who are dying of starvation, which is terrible. But as Amber just told us, uh, you can't, you're conflating things. You can't say just because they're in ketosis is the ketones that are problematic there. It's, you know, if anything, they're probably helping the people by giving them some fuel. Um, but um, there's also ketoacidosis, which is um, what diabetics experience. And, and that's when ketones go so high that they get really dangerous for you. Um, but what we're talking about here is neither starvation nor ketoacidosis. It's going to be levels of ketones that you can get while eating and eating enough calories, which is what Amber was saying. And um, yes, those calories can't be coming from carbs because, as she's just said, the carbs have to be low and the fat has to be high. So you're going to have to still keep the carbs low, but you can rely on fat and you can rely on protein, surprisingly, quite a bit of protein, she was saying, um, and still get this ketosis. Okay, so that's just a layperson quick summary of some things that I just want to make sure everyone knew. Um, yeah, I did but, jump ahead quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's awesome. I think that's what's so wonderful about Amber's section, about your section in this textbook, is that you actually dive right in. And, and it does mean that you're going to have to read her section a few times. But she touches on things that aren't generally touched on. And I know when I was I was doing my master's degree and I was looking at potentially doing my PhD on, on – um, on mitochondrial function in, in human muscle tissue um, in this oxygraph machine. And I was trying to like go back into all the pathways and things. I found it was actually surprisingly really hard to find the pathways that ketones are produced via. And it, it, it's hard to find. Whereas Amber kind of lays it all out in a really friendly manner in her in her section and tells us why it's relevant and you know what role glucose and gluconeogenesis plays in this and the different phases of ketones and fasting. So it's really it, it I spent ages trying to figure out these pathways and you've just made it so clear in your in your chapter, Amber. So I think I think, yes, you dive into the deep end, but it's good. It's good that you do, because where <laughs> else where else do we get exposed to this information? OK, but basically, well, okay, so now, we, now we've got the Maybe sorry, we could well, talk about the phases of fasting, because that, okay, that's a, let's do that. a big part of the chapter. And and I think it's important for understanding mm -hmm. how the body gets fuel under when when different things are available, the body uses different mm -hmm. things. So, yeah. so, and it kind of demonstrates how the how and when ketones come into play. And you know, we talk about a ketogenic metabolism, and ketones ketone bodies themselves are really important and have therapeutic value. But in a sense, they're kind of a um, a side effect of the of the ketogenic metabolism. Um, what happens is that they, they are produced out of fat, but what's happening is that your body is using mostly fat as fuel. And mm -hmm. so ketones are kind of a marker that you're in that state. So, so right. when, when an animal who has been eating a high carb diet, um, mm -hmm. so um, say a human, stops eating food altogether, the, the body is going to continue using glucose primarily as fuel. Basically, we have, two, we have two modes. Cells, almost all cells can use either glucose or fat. It's always a combination, but one is always more dominant than the other. And when one's more dominant, uh, you know, the body optimizes for that. So the cells will more readily take up glucose when you're in a glucose mode, and they'll less readily take up glucose and be more sort of glucose intolerant and more um, welcoming of fats when you're, when you're predominantly using fat. And so 
when you stop eating your last meal that was high in glucose, your body is still primed to be in that high glucose mode. It's not using fat so easily. And that's part of that whole keto adaptation thing that Eric was, uh, that Dr. Westman was talking about. Um, so first, first what happens is you still have um, a little bit of storage of glucose in the body, not very much. It's in the liver in the form of glycogen. And so when you, when you stop eating and you've used up what you've just eaten and your, your body is still searching for glucose to use for all its cells, it will, it will be using the glycogen coming out of your liver and that, that will keep your blood sugar up to normal rates and so that your body can use that. But that very quickly runs out. It takes about two or three days. And if you're an endurance athlete, for example, or you do some aerobic exercise that can be hastened. Um, you can get into ketosis actually in a couple of hours if you do enough aerobic exercise. Um, so once that runs out, now you're now you can't rely on that for fuel. And what what happens is your your insulin level will go down because it doesn't have the the glucose that's priming it to go up, and that that's a kind of signal that a uh, allows fat to start coming out of your fat stores and provide you with, with fat that becomes the next fuel that you will use. Now, if, if you have a lot of fat on your body, um, which is not true of most mammals, actually, um, humans, if you think of even the most lean human that you can think of, like a bodybuilder, even that person is going to have, say, three times as much fat on their body than uh, another primate, like a gorilla, would have, and so even some someone that we think of as very lean is actually very fat from a from a mammal perspective, <laughs> and and that I think is quite evolutionarily adaptive specifically for this purpose, um, so that we can use fat. Um, so so all of a sudden the the insulin has gone down and, and fat starts um, coming out into the bloodstream, providing energy, and all of these adaptations start happening in response to the lower glucose and the fat availability, and they both have to be there. Um, so if you are, if you're in that state and you have a lot of fat on your body, or you're supplementing it with fat from the outside, which we would do in the non-starvation context, then that perpetuates this metabolic state where um, where fats are being used by the cells and the, in the liver, the, the combination of low glucose availability and high fat, they both have to be there. High fat availability will start producing those ketones. And then that's, that's a really nice, um, smooth kind of transition uh, where your brain continues to get all the fuel it needs from one, um, from one state to the other. And in, in the starvation context, not only are you not getting carbohydrates and not getting fat from the outside, but you have some on your body at that point, but you're not getting um, protein. Protein obviously can be used to make glucose. And so if, if you don't have glucose from the outside and you're not getting protein to make more, then the body is starts optimizing for lower glucose needs. So there are many things that are going on at the same time when you're, when you're in a very high fat state and a very low carbohydrate and even a low protein state um, that reduces the need for glucose. So one of them is that um, when a fat, a fat normally comes in the form of a triglyceride and that glyceride part is, is glycerol, which is holding three fatty acid chains together. And so when that's broken down to be used to, to metabolize for energy, you're left with a glycerol backbone. And that glycerol can be used actually to, to make glucose. So that's, that's one component that can spare. So I just want to, I want to make glucose. a point because you've spoken that glucose is, is produced from protein, but obviously you're not going to want to do that because the body wants to try and kind of save its protein, its muscle, its enzymes, whatever. But that's you also right. mentioned that glucose can be made from glycerol. And I just, that's something actually that we should have, I should have mentioned right in the beginning. And I just want to be clear to everyone that our bodies can make glucose. It is not an essential nutrient. And I think this is, this is part of this chapter. So I just want that to be clear. We, by going low carb, you can go zero carb, not that that's actually possible because even muscle meat contains carbs, to, you know, a bit, but let's say you go effectively zero carbs, you are not actually zero carbs. 
because your body can make carbs if not out of protein and out of fat so just just note that everybody carry on sorry amber <laughs> no that's an excellent point and in fact um we think of i think we often think about other mammals or animals as being sort of glucose based and that that's the kind of default animal kingdom state and it's actually quite rare all mammals um by by default almost all mammals actually are making most of their glucose needs um, endogenously in the body, even, and, and they're almost all on this glucose-based metabolism, unless mm. they're in a, in a starvation context. But, um, so obviously carnivores are not like wild carnivores, like cats and, and um, uh, wild dogs say, or, or um, birds of prey, even though um, they're, not eating any carbohydrate, they're not normally in a ketogenic state. And that's because they're eating so much protein that they are using the protein to make enough glucose perpetually to keep them in a, glu in a glucose-based metabolism unless they, unless they are actually starving and they're not getting enough protein, then only then would they go into ketosis. Um, so is that then, then an argument about not overdoing protein if you want to stay in ketosis, especially if you're looking at there, not that now I'm digressing. So, um, <laughs> but especially if you're wanting to therapeutically treat things like cancer, for example, with this very specific blood ketone to glucose ratio, is the concern there about going high protein because you're going, the protein is going to be gluconeogenic. In other words, you're going to make glucose out of the protein. Is that the concern well, there? Yes and no. So as I said earlier, and, and I, I didn't go into it very deeply, but humans have a, a much higher tolerance for protein than most other animals yes. do. And in, in the sense of being able to stay ketogenic, even with quite a bit of protein, but there's a, there's how much, a, how much is quite a bit of <laughs> that's a good question. So um, I tend to go with the, you know, there've been a lot of studies on how much protein is minimum. And basically what people look at is how much can you eat before um, the, the nitrogen loss that you would measure in urine, for example, would be more or not be more than how much is coming in. And so different studies have come up with different numbers for how much you actually need. And of course, there's individual variants as well. Uh, I, I tend to go with the say 1.2 to 1.5 gram per kilogram of mm -hmm. ideal body reference weight um, as a guideline for how much would be minimum. And getting minimum protein should never interfere with ketosis, but the question is like how much more can you eat and it mm -hmm. not put you out of ketosis? And then as another sort of digression on top of that, being in and out of ketosis makes it sound like it's an on and off switch and it really isn't. Like there's a there's a, a, a gradual, it is a continuum. It's not really linear because um, mm -hmm. there's, there is this sort of transition where your metabolism is really uh, optimized for using fat versus optimized for using keto, uh, using glucose. And when you're kind of on the edge of that, it, mm -hmm. it, it, um, it doesn't feel like it's one state or the other, but then once you get to further toward one state or the other, things sort of snap into place and optimize into it a mm -hmm. whole different uh, way of running. Um, so it's not exactly linear and it's not an, exactly an on and off switch. There's some gradation, but once you're well into ketosis, the difference between say being at 1.0 millimoles might not be that different from being at 5.0 millimoles um, okay. in terms of being in ketosis. Um, yes. So, but some people are much more sensitive to protein than others, especially okay. people who have a history of diabetes tend to have much lower protein tolerance. And I think that's because of their baseline state of insulin and glucagon and the dynamics there that the it's really not so much about the protein being available to make glucose mm -hmm. out of because we don't, we don't, just because something's there, we don't necessarily use it. But mm -hmm. if the, but the, the hormonal response when you eat protein will often um, change the dynamics, the whole fuel dyna dam dynamics in, in preparation for what the body's expecting. Okay, so thank you, Amber. So Amber, <laughs> I, yes. I, I'm very cognizant of time, and I feel like we haven't covered even half of what I wanted to cover with you so far. And we've only got 10 minutes. But before I do, there's quickly one question by Anne Brennan, um, who asks, 
if if you have hyperinsulinemia, would that have a different effect on allowing fat to be released? And obviously, Absolutely. yeah. Yeah, yeah because so, insulin, you just you just said that insulin is 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 fat storing. So if you have high insulin, I imagine you would be in fat storing mode. That's right. So if you're a healthy person with a kind of normally functioning metabolism and you reduce your carbohydrates, your insulin levels should drop and the fat will start to be released from fat cells more easily the way I described earlier. But if you have hyperinsulinemia for some kind of other reason, uh, you mentioned, and, and I didn't get a chance to see, um, uh, Dr. Crufts was talking about the different um, functions of insulin uh, hmm. you mentioned. And one of the functions of insulin is, is immunological. Um, it, insulin is a, a, a repair state, um, building the body up kind of hormone. And so if you have uh, an immune, immunological response, you've had some damage to the body or you've had an infection and the body will, will raise insulin to, um, to, to prep the body to be doing this building stuff. And, and one of the ways that it builds is by, you know, not, not releasing things, but building them up instead. And fat, fat sort of, <laughs> it falls into that category. Insulin is, yeah. it's a very general hormone and it's, so it's, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, doesn't have a very specific, necessarily specific um, hmm. functions. It has a lot of specific things that it, it does, but um, one thing can raise it and then it has this widespread effect across hmm. the body is, is what I'm trying to say. And so yeah. if you have uh, hyperinsulinemia, that usually indicates that you have this kind of ongoing, your body is in this ongoing state where it's trying to repair something. And, and then that unfortunately is going to make it much harder for uh, you to release fat, which means um, if you just reduce carbohydrates, that should bring your insulin down somewhat, but it might not bring it down enough to release as much fat as you were hoping. And, and if you're in that state, then you might actually feel a lack of energy um, because if you're not getting it from carbohydrate and you're not getting it from the fat that you that you have that's on your body, um, from a just from a an observed point of view, your body feels like it doesn't have enough energy. It is not going to have the the energy to run all the things that it needs, and that's mm. why it can be really important to eat fat, even though you know, from an intuitive point of view, someone might say, well, well the whole point is not to eat fat because so you can get it from your body, but just Maybe not start out it. by eating fat until yeah. you're adapt, until you adapt. Right. And then so, eating so that would, fat yeah. um, will, will help with that hormonal uh, response that, that will then even further lower insulin and uh, raise mm -hmm. glucagon that will hopefully act bootstrap more of the ability to burn your own fat yeah and then you can just progressively spontaneously you will end up probably reducing your energy intake from um from fat as you start to burn your own fat stores instead but now amber we were going through the three phases of fasting and we digress in so many really interesting <laughs> interesting ways so if we can summarize them okay i got the first phase which is uh, you're relying on glucose because you just eaten and then it may take you a matter of hours if you're exercising a lot. Otherwise, it may take you like two, three days to uh, go through the stored glucose in the form of glycogen um, and start running more on on fat and ketones. So is that so which so the first phase is the fed? Is that the fed? No. Fed state. And the second. Yeah, phase it is, is that like ketone, you might call it post absorptive and, and you're just okay. getting rid of the last bits of glucose and the second phase you're running primarily on fat. Then if you're in the starvation context, mm -hmm. eventually the fat levels will run out. They don't have to run out completely, but the amount that you can release is dependent on how much you have. It's sort of rate limited by the number of adipose cells that you have. Yeah. And once it gets low enough that that. Um, the flux of fat that's coming out and that your body can detect is too low to really um, fuel all your needs. Mm -hmm. And the body changes metabolic state again. It, it, there's no choice but to go back to- a That would be far. Person. I imagine that's really, really far in because- Yeah. When you run and, out of fat, and, I mean- 
And critically, it doesn't normally happen in humans because humans, like I said, have so much fat on their body mm -hmm. that um, um, if you're actually in a starvation context, so the whole time that you're in that phase two, if you're not getting any protein at all, there's still enough need for glucose that your body will slowly be catabolizing protein. A lot of things are coming into play to spare glucose to minimize that. And ketone bodies themselves actually have a, like a, 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 a signal telling the body not to catabolize lean tissue, but there's going to be some slow, gradual decline of lean mass all that time if you're not replacing it with, mm. with the requirement of protein. So in the actual starvation context, um, humans have so much fat that their organs are actually going to probably be compromised. Animals that are very fat will die of organ failure before they will run out of fat and go to phase three starvation. But animals that are much leaner, uh, who don't have that much fat and can go more quickly from phase two to phase three, and uh, what mm -hmm. happens is that suddenly they will get the signal, you're out of fat, there's no other choice but to start really mm -hmm. like uh, catabolizing lean mass in a, in a strong way, um, corticosteroids will go up to to um, signal to start really mm -hmm. catabolizing lean mass, and it's kind of an emergency situation. And then you're using you're actually using protein to to provide the glucose that you couldn't get otherwise because it's the last mm -hmm. resort, it's the last choice. And so you know there are different there are different ways to do a ketogenic diet if you're if you're mostly uh, doing a ketogenic diet that has just adequate protein to preserve that, to you know, mm -hmm. spare the lean mass that you need to spare and getting all of your energy from fat, either from your body or from your diet, then it's looking more like phase two. And okay. if, if on the other hand, you're, you're eating um, a lot of protein and you're, you're sort of only mildly ketogenic because uh, there's not enough fat to really uh, uptick the, the fat uh, oxidation, mm -hmm. then it, you're going to have less, um, <laughs> you're going to have less components like glycerol uh, from the breakdown of fat because you're not eating as much fat mm -hmm. and you're going to have to actually eat a lot more protein. And so eat, eat, if you're eating less fat and higher protein, then it's looking more like phase three uh, starvation uh, where you're there's actually a higher cortisol response, which may or may not be uh, detrimental. I know cortisol gets a lot of bad rap, but mm -hmm. it's not actually all bad. Um, <laughs> so, but as uh, as long as you're eating enough protein to to make up for the fact that you're not sparing it quite as much, mm -hmm. um, then that can that can be sustainable for a longer time too. But it won't have the same level of um, say medical benefit that one might expect from a highly ketogenic diet mm. uh, but it but it may also um, be a perfectly sustainable way to eat so that's why amber you you know you've coined the term term lipovore and um, we actually did speak yesterday about um about how humans have preferentially hunted big fat animals you know so this this actually feeds into that uh, no pun intended on the word feed but um that we really want uh, we want to have enough fat so that we can stay in that optimum phase two um, of fasting, if you will. So that that leads me on to kind of with regards to ketones. Now we know what they are. We know how you get them. You could fast, you could starve. Um, we can eat a lot of fat and very little glucose and hopefully sufficient protein. Other than um, running the brain, which is something we mentioned, um, what 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 do ketones do? Why do we even want to be in ketosis? What what's the point? I mean, we have fat to run to run most of our our body tissues. We have gluconeogenesis, which can run most of well, maybe let's say we're really in ketosis, and maybe twenty percent of our brain and eighty percent, if we're doing really well, can maybe come from ketones. Okay, so the but other than the brain. What is the point? Why are there clinical benefits with ketones? Why are we talking about ketosis? What, what's going on? Well, you know, I don't want to undersell ketones because they do actually have a lot of interesting benefits. And I think um, some of the studies that are helping us figure out what the difference, like which components of a ketogenic metabolism, which components of the benefit are coming from the ketones themselves and which are coming just from the all of the myriad other things that are happening when you're in a so-called ketogenic 
metabolic state like it's hard to carbs, tell the lower insulin all that stuff we were talking about yeah and many of these different um uh, sort of enzymatic or uh, metabolic kinds of functions all kinds of things happen um so for example um People have long wondered, why is it that a ketogenic diet uh, is so effective for epilepsy? And it's actually not completely known. There are a bunch of different theories about why. And only one of them is that it has to do with the ketones themselves. And, and it's probably actually a, a whole lot of things in combination. But for example, um, some of the uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids like uh, arachidonic acid and um, um, DHA are, are go way up in the bloodstream when you're on a ketogenic diet. Um, there's a whole component of adenosine levels in the brain which go up on a ketogenic diet. Uh, there's the, the change in um, NAD uh, to NADH uh, metabolic ratio uh, and different authors have uh, been proponents of different ideas for why uh, ketogenic metabolism is so good for epilepsy. And so it's only um, that the, the ketone bodies themselves do have very interesting effects, but it's only um, studies, for example, where you're taking exogenous ketones, where we can start mm -hmm. to see, you know, what, what part of what's happening, what part of the benefits are coming from the ketones themselves, and what part is coming from the lower glucose and all of these other dynamics that are going on at the same time. So we have learned certain things like uh, ketone bodies have signaling functions. Uh, they have, uh, they're actually seems to be some evidence that they're incorporated into certain kinds of phospholipids, which we barely know anything about, but I should mention it. Um, there, there's an effect on inflammation. Inflammation, like cortisol, is something that gets kind of um, bad rap, but inflammation is really um, a name for the process of healing. <laughs> so you have these uh, kind of standard ways that we think about what is inflammation like swelling and and redness and heat and these are all things that happen when the body is trying to repair something inflammation is really important and good and, and in an acute sense but if you have inflammation going on all the time um then that's on on the one hand it's an indication that you're not actually repairing the thing that's problem that's a problem or that you're continuing to damage your body in an ongoing way from something um, and also, um, I think that just from a kind of evolutionary or physiological perspective, inflammation is um, meant to be something that happens for a short term to do the repair mm -hmm. and then stop. And so there are things that um, there are sort of side effects of inflammation that if they go on for a long time, are going to start causing problems of their own and be this whole cascade. So all of that is a preface to say that in some cases, um, ketone bodies themselves seem to be anti-inflammatory, and in other cases, they seem to be pro-inflammatory. Um, but they seem to be pro-inflammatory exactly when it's there's there's an infection that needs to be addressed. So it's like it ramps yes, up, it enhances the inflammation. Um, mm -hmm. But um, in the anti-inflammatory sense, it seems like um, that might be because the inflammation has been effective and so it's no longer needed but it, it's it can be hard to tease apart what you mean when you say that something's anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory oh, wow. and if it's that's fascinating not. i didn't realize that um that they could be pro-inflammatory as well but that makes that's that obviously makes sense that one would definitely want inflammation occasionally um so now i'm sure there's lots more things that ketones do but we are out of time but i didn't even get to touch on on the contextual nature of nutrition in the context of ketogenic diets and so if you do have five more minutes to spare amber i would like to just quickly touch on that before we sign off because i think you did touch on it when you were talking about the dha going up in the bloodstream in the context of keto um a keto and adenosine and so clearly the context the metabolic context that you are in when you're in the state You've kind of switched. You're 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 functioning in a kind of different way, different pathways, different nutrients would be required for those different pathways, I would assume. Um, so so in this chapter, you talk about the contextual nature of nutrition within the context of a ketogenic diet, um, and you make a case for an animal-based nutrition over plant nutrition. Um, in this context. So I think if you could just very briefly 
<laughs> touch on this ginormous, ginormous topic um, and tell us, you know, basically why, why would we need to potentially, let's say something like as simple as vitamin C. I mean, that's a big one that gets, gets thrown around, you know, um, how can this, this way of eating, especially a carnival way of eating where you're not eating a whole lot of oranges, um, you're not getting enough vitamin C. Are you going to get scurvy? What about all the phytonutrients and antioxidants in plants? You know, you don't want to cut all of those out. And, um, you know, I also know you talk about things through an immunological lens and talk about domestic versus foreign um, nutrients and, and the role that they have in the diet. So basically, in as short period as you can, I'm so sorry to ask this of you, could you kind of tell us the, about nutrition being contextual, perhaps, and, yeah, and touch yeah. on some of these plant animal things before we sign off? Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a huge topic and one of my favorite things to talk about. But the, the so everyone's basic just going to have to idea... buy the book and read it. They're really <laughs> going to have to do that because we're, we're five minutes or two minutes is not enough to get through get through this topic. Um, and in fact, Amber, you just didn't have enough space in the textbook to investigate as much as we all would have liked to. But definitely, you dive into it. Okay, go 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 go. <laughs> right, sure. So so if you back up and, and think about what a vitamin or essential nutrient is for, it's it's almost all based on requirements for metabolic functions. And if, like you said, you're changing your metabolic state from, from one kind of pathway that's predominant to another pathway that's predominant, then the, so a, what a, a vitamin is, is a, a coenzyme that's required for a, a biochemical reaction that's happening in the body. And so if you're, if the biochemical reactions that are happening mostly change from one to another, then that can obviously change the amount of something that is needed. Uh, so that's one way that the diet can have a contextual effect. Another way is that um, different things that you eat can have uh, different uh, effects on what nutrients you need. So for example, uh, if you're eating a diet that's very high in grains or legumes, those have uh, an interference on the absorption of certain minerals, for example. So your zinc needs uh, specifically, as in a concrete example, are going to go way up if you're eating a grain-based diet um, compared to um, a diet that doesn't have any grains at all. And so there, there are all kinds of nutrient needs that we would expect to be affected by, by the elimination of high carbohydrate sources um, that would be common on a diet in which we, <laughs> we got all of our uh, foundational notions about what nutrients we need in the first place. Well, we tend to think about them as something that's fixed, like a human needs this much this and this much that. And we don't really think about the context in which all of those ranges were derived. And then um, uh, another thing um, that can happen is that certain nutrients can spare the need for other nutrients. And that comes up in vitamin C. So for example, two important things that vitamin C is known to be needed for is for the formation of collagen and for the um, formation of carnitine. Carnitine is used to shuttle fat into mitochondria for oxidation. And so obviously <laughs> you need a lot of carnitine the more fat that you're using. Um, but uh, if you're eating meat, meat is actually loaded with carnitine. The word carnitine itself means car car carny, right? <laughs> is for meat. And so it turns out that if you're eating a lot of meat, the need for uh, carnitine, you can, you can get the carnitine directly. It's not the case with collagen, but you can get that carnitine directly and you don't need as much vitamin C to, to actually make carnitine. So meat can be uh, vitamin C sparing actually. Um, and then another um, component that vitamin C is very important for is its uh, antioxidation properties. And I can't really go into this very deeply now, but um, on a ketogenic diet, you may be getting a lot more of your antioxidation from uric acid going up than from vitamin C. And so there's a dynamic in ratios there too. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that um, being on a ketogenic diet on the one hand and being on a carnivore diet on the other hand can change the dynamics of what nutrients that you that you need. And although we don't have the data from studying to say 
exactly what new recommendations might be. We can definitely talk about like what kind of direction it would go in. Like we could we can be fairly confident in saying zinc needs will go down when you when you don't eat grains. Uh, how much they will go down, we don't know, but it's a it's a great open area that I'm quite excited to see research on. Well, Amber, I think this is just so fascinating because as you say, people assume that the RDA or the NRV or whatever is set in stone. It's, you know, everyone needs, well, at least 98% of people need this amount um, in order, you know, to not get deficiency conditions or at least suboptimal amounts. But it's clearly contextual. This is clearly not set in stone and it clearly depends on what you are eating and what metabolic state you're in. And, and you describe it really beautifully and you go through quite a few of these nutrients, such as DHA as well, in your in your section in the textbook. So I highly recommend that everyone goes and refers to that. Um, yeah, Amber goes into a lot more detail into all of these things and the biochemistry uh, link to it as well in a, in a very clear succinct but in-depth kind of way and so i think everyone could really do with reading reading your sections amber they're amazing but unfortunately we're going to have to wrap up now um like i said i really could talk to amber all day because she's just a genius um and wonderful just to find out all the things that are going on in her head but you can get a brief glimpse into some of them um through this obviously and through the and through the textbook so definitely chapter two is a must read um and amber we are so so thankful that you contributed your time and your expertise to this really pivotal crucial central aspect of this textbook um thank you so so much and thank you for your time today as well it's been fascinating thank you it's been really an honor to be part of this project Thank you. And to all of our audience, uh, thank you so much for listening and asking questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to more of them. Um, if you're watching after the time, we appreciate it. And I look forward to either Hasina Kaji, Dr. Hasina Kaji, or myself will be um, interview doing the future interviews for the other chapters. And we look forward to chatting to you about all of those. We have a lot more to talk about. Um, this textbook is filled with a lot more really interesting stuff. So have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, night, whatever, wherever you are on the globe. Um, and thank you so much, Amber, for your time. Thank Goodbye, you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye.